going in just an instant. Okay, we're just letting Google Hangout come up so we can see if we <laughs> so we can see if um, it's showing up. So we're just waiting for confirmation on the the channel to make sure that the Second Life portion of it is showing up. Okay, we're just waiting for the Second Life screen to show up, and we will get started. We're still watching for it on YouTube. Oh, we have you here. Excellent. <laughs> And for anybody who's listening in Second Life <laughs> and also listening on the YouTube channel, I, I suggest you mute one of the audios because there, there is a little bit of a difference. And it will make you crazy. It will, ab it will absolutely make you crazy. <laughs> okay. So here we are here today, and we're very, very lucky. Um, we have Dr. Chris Haskell from Boise State um, and from also this wonderful entrepreneurial educational um, company known as 3D Game Lab. And our topic today is gamification and gamification is quite the buzzword. And the thing with gamification... And the thing with gamification um, being quite a buzzword, it means that the marketers have taken it over. <laughs> but um, Dr. Haskell and Dr. Lisa Dolly are also doing something wonderful with it when it comes to education. Um, so with that, I I'd ask um, Dr. Haskell to introduce himself a little bit more and, and tell us what he's doing. OK. Um it's really strange to be uh, referred to as Dr. Haskell. It's a relatively new thing. Um, maybe I'll get used to it by the time I get done paying off my student loans. I hope so. So 40 years from now, uh, maybe it'll feel normal. I am a, a clinical assistant professor at Boise State University, which is my alma mater. Um, I started at that university in 1990 uh, as an undergrad and have just kind of uh, hung around and come back and, and uh, finally, they just they turned an old broom closet into an office, and, and I think I'm there to stay. But uh, we do some really cool stuff in uh, virtual worlds and, uh, and other spaces as, uh, as a method of uh, just expanding our environment. Sorry, I'll make my avatar stand up and look a little bit more uh, normal here. Uh, I have a, a real interest in games and game-based approaches applied to learning, mostly because it gives me an excuse to play Xbox and tell my wife I'm doing research. So if, you have, uh, if you've ever wanted to figure out how to make that work, that's it. Become a researcher in educational gaming. And I've, I've been a gamer for a long time. Um, I own, well, I'm not going to drag you through the house on a tour, but I own uh, a number of vintage arcade games and have been uh, really interested in the way games work and one of the reasons that uh, the games inspire us um, for a long time. Uh, I, have a, I have a vintage 1980 Pac-Man, original yellow cabinet, white marquee. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. Original 78 Space Invaders, but again with the hand-painted uh, full-size upright cabinet. 
and uh, and a handful of other games that uh, that you might think are cool, including a Crystal Castle, 1982. Um, so I've got some good old vintage arcade games that work great and uh, are good for spending a little research time on. Um, we're really interested in this idea of of the way games reward learners. Uh, we see we see some pretty interesting things happening in spaces like, uh, well, World of Warcraft, uh, it, in other MMOs, in uh, in games that are largely built around first-person shooters, and the communities that support them. And we're interested because they don't require any coercion to get you to be involved. And some of the games, despite their uh, their big-ticket uh, budgets, are not actually that complex and the uh, the types of things that you're asked to do in a game like World of Warcraft are relatively simple and repetitive. Go here, uh, kill, capture, collect this many of this thing. Um, go to this location, escort this thing from here to there, go buy this, deliver it there. I mean it's there's a lot of legwork that you do in a game like that yet it's the most popular online game ever created. The mission and the questing that you do is simple, but yet it's incredibly uh, sustaining as an environment, and there's a lot of persistence there. So we're interested in, in what what's happening that make people interested in sticking around, because if we can apply those types of things to learning and, uh, and really figure out what makes uh, learners tick in that respect, maybe look at different systems of uh, offering feedback and rewards, uh, we might be able to at least uh, give us some new direction uh, as far as how we might organize uh, curriculum. We've been doing that for the last couple of years at Boise State. We uh, piloted our own kind of game-based approach. And as we're at this interesting point talking about game-based approaches, I really think it's valuable for us to put a separator between the idea of games for learning and making learning into a game because they're very different. And I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. This idea that uh, that using an off-the-shelf game as a learning activity and applying the right context to it is is a pretty popular idea. Uh, also uh, related to, but not in the same field, this idea of taking an environment built for learning and adding some feedback structures and uh, reward structures to it and turning it itself into a game. Uh, both of those are interesting to us uh, because they're related, but but the latter uh, more so than the former in what we've been working on. So I, I guess that's kind of just some basic background before we dive in. Is this the direction uh, we want to go, or do we want to take a detour first? Oh, I, I think this is absolutely great, but um, does any does anybody have any questions they'd like to pose right away or any comments? I mean, yeah, let's I, steer this together if we can, uh, <laughs> so that yeah, so that people are able to you know get out of this what they want. I mean, my goodness, I've got a you know I've got a 17 year old daughter who knows uh, more about this than I could put her on. <laughs> okay, so grid jump. Well, the discussion while you were talking was more about was more about gear in the different <laughs> games you were talking about. <laughs> Yeah, and and then the comments we're getting now um, in Second Life are waiting with bated breath for more. Um, I'm all for the path you are currently walking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so let's um, let's actually just chat about real quick if we can the paradigm of education. The current paradigm of education is changing dramatically, and whether we think about it in these terms or not, let me just kind of go back over the brief history lesson that we all know about since the creation of the American continent, that are, there have been four, maybe five, depending on how you break it out, major paradigms in education. Um, and they have all been influenced. The change has always uh, been influenced by, uh, by the culture and societal change. Uh, the uh, you know, school as it originated was o only for wealthy people, mostly just for boys, and you had to be white and not Irish. I'm not kidding. Those were some of the stipulations. You could be educated by Jesuits or uh, in school. Not everyone had to learn how to read in colonial America because that wasn't part of your job. It was a skill that you acquired to do something. Now we can't imagine uh, living a life without literacy. Uh, but there was a time when it was not really necessary. 
those schools were uh, were uh, managed and maintained uh, and and promoted by the groups who benefited most from having them there. They served that segment of the population, and that's not to not to say that they were keeping education from everyone. It just wasn't valued uh, like it is today. That changed when we moved westward. We started to expand into this vast United States, and uh, and it was necessary for these small communities, if you will. In, uh, in Walnut Grove, Minnesota, our little house on the prairie, it was necessary for them to be able to teach their children things so that they could survive in that community, far away from that you know, towering metropolis of Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, some of you are going down memory lane here. You're you know, thinking, thinking about that old show. I loved it. I, I'll be honest, I had a little bit of a crush on Nellie Olson. I know she was mean, but maybe I, I liked that back then when I was eight. Anyway. The idea that, uh, that a community needed their own sets of knowledge uh, was, a, was a valuable one. And, and because of it, these little one-room schoolhouses popped up. And what was learned in those schools was determined by the founding fathers, by the church uh, that was prominent in the area, and by the parents who sent their kids. And you didn't go for 12 years. You went for two or for six or for five, whatever was necessary for you to do what your family thought you ought to do and and to learn what you needed to know. A teacher taught, um, you know, in essence, what would be a first, second grader all the way through fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, depending on it, um, and taught all of them simultaneously. It was, a, it was a really neat prospect. That changed in the 1850s uh, as a uh, is kind of a, a mandate of industrialism. Uh, starting in the Northeast, people like Horace Mann uh, recognized all of the, the really effective elements of the industrial movement. This idea that you could regulate a process and get one of a number of products, including the highest possible product and the lowest possible product. Our grading system that we use today comes from this strange practice. The idea that, uh, that there are those that are more valuable than others doesn't really match our, our ideology today. I mean, we want all students to be successful in the environment. But we're in a system that recognizes fault and then categorizes that fault into a grade area. Um, we want our students to get A's, but we're willing to let them get C's, D's, and F's because that's the system that we have. So I'm a big proponent that the grade books should die and go away forever, that we are an intelligent uh, culture and that we can come up with more effective ways to track learning of students without penalizing them and then trying to instill in them that that penalty should motivate them to learn. So there's, there's a <laughs> kill the grade book, absolutely. Um, I've been without uh, a traditional grade book for two years now and I have seen nothing but success, but we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, so that, that paradigm is really familiar. Imagine uh, the plant manager or the floor manager walking along the Model T production line in Ford's uh, factory, grading each of those uh, couches that came in, or excuse me, couches, uh, each of those, um, you know, those seats, each of those steering wheels, and deciding which quality product they were going to go into. Was this the one that was going to go to that fancy uh, dealership in Manhattan, or was this one going to go to, uh, well, Duluth? Who knows? And, and they were graded. If something was really bad, they would throw it out. Um, it would never get sold. Uh, but w that grade book, where every component is uh, graded at the same point against, basically compared to the others, is what we have Today, this idea stuck around, ringing bells, factory rows, we think about the way our classrooms are organized, um, buildings d uh, set apart for the development of specific uh, kinds of knowledge, uh, the agrarian calendar. I mean, all these things are very industrial. And the idea that every student comes in, uh, put through the same conditions, comes out on the other side. We know, we know that this is the way it works. Um, there was one other paradigm, minor paradigm, uh, well, major for our culture, but minor in the organization of school, um, and that was uh, the, um, the civil rights movement. I mean, we have schools now that are integrated that allow anyone to come in. We didn't always have that. 
Um, we have more equity between uh, men and women, although still not all the way there. But what we see, and I think that this is the really important part, is we see the influence of society and culture between 30 and 50 years later in schools than we do in society. So uh, industrialism started 1830s through 1840s. We see the uh, 1870s, 80s, and 90s as being that real era where compulsory school that uh, starts to get organized in an industrial fashion really takes off. Um, same thing with, uh, with each of those other paradigm shifts. So what are we expecting right now? We're going to see a major systemic change in education and have already started to see it built around these principles of the information revolution. That information is free and accessible. That there are uh, multiplicitous ways that we can learn things, coming up with ways that we can get credit and mark our progress through the, you know, different curricular needs uh, is, is part of that as well. We're going to see a uh, dramatic change uh, from the industrial system uh, to a different one. We're already starting to see this. Uh, the number of alternative uh, and charter schools popping up, the number of institutions offering credentialing being accepted by schools and major institutions, the entire idea of credit recovery, right? That there is another way that you can earn these credits, not just by passing the class the first time you take it. We see, we see the influence of, of the Khan Academy, um, although terribly didactic and still kind of trapped in that old paradigm, we start to see these, these pieces influencing education. And uh, education will change more in the next 10 years than it has in the last 100. And it will change built around the tools of gathering and disseminating information that have changed our society completely. If you don't believe me, tweet me about it and, uh, and I'll fire a tweet right back at you. By the way, um, just so we're clear, uh, and I, this is a savvy group, but um, I presented recently to a group of older uh, teachers and they were unfamiliar with Twitter. Some of them thought tweeting was when you peed in your pants a little bit. And so if that's what you think, please don't tweet. So it's true. So this idea that, um, that we're in the process of this monumental change is, is what excites us and uh, what helps us to kind of look for, okay, how, how is this going to look? And so I can give you what we believe, and my own research, uh, which is really just reading other people's research, uh, helps me to kind of frame is that there are a handful of things that, uh, that we will begin to see. First of all, that time-based delivery uh, is starting to be a thing of the past. We've always had this kind of alternative approach to uh, pacing yourself through a class, but there are, there are things that just don't work anymore in education. Um, First of all, our students recognize that there is a broad difference between learning in the real world and learning in school. First of all, we punish them. We try to teach them responsibility and we don't credit them for what they know or are able to do already. Uh, nor do we recognize what, uh, often what uh, gaps that they have in their schema moving forward and tell them to buckle down. So we, we give them this nice box, which is a class, and in this box are the things that you need to learn. It doesn't matter if you pull something out of that box and you have no clue what it is because you don't have the schema to prepare yourself to kind of move into that, um, into that realm. It doesn't mean that you're, you're, you have a lack of intelligence. It means that you lack the experience to know what to do with this thing. Now, once you have that schema, it's easy to attend to. You go, oh, I know how to do this, and, the, and it's all logical. But we're so concerned about, okay, what, is, what are we going to teach rather than what can we help the students learn? I think that that's a really important piece. We focus on, okay, what are we going to teach rather than, okay, what do the students know and how can we move them along this continuum? Rather than a series of stacked boxes, which we would call Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, Pre-Calc, right? we should think about classwork as this continuum. And if you start here, somewhere in the middle of Algebra 1, 
and can climb all the way to the middle of uh, geometry in a single semester, then you should. But the structures don't allow us to do that. And that's one of the problems that we're facing. So we're l always looking for ways to approach that where we can allow students to start where they start and move as far as they can through the curriculum without being held back by things like due dates and homework and tests and quizzes. Um, and I, the, the type of tests and quizzes I mean are, are very didactic, uh, multiple choice types of questions. We, we've all seen you know, the, the research that shows that continued testing really lowers the amount of practical use that students may have for that knowledge. That they're not learning things authentically in ways that they can be used, they're just committing them to uh, that kind of midterm, short to midterm memory. They don't stick around forever. So, and there's a lot of chat going on here, and I'll, I'll take, a, take a breather in a second and kind of jump in there. So, so here, here are some ideas. That, that I believe will be a big part of the next uh, big piece. First of all, homework will be not necessarily a thing of the past, but selective and guided by the student. Um, it's terribly, I think, insulting to assume that every student has four hours of after school time that they can dedicate to uh, curricular activities. This is not to say on any level that they should not think about or interact with school material outside of school. But we as teachers and designers of curriculum can't control what their life looks like out of school. We can't decide which of our students have that homework block, have those parents that are really interested in helping them succeed that way, um, or on the other side, those that are the primary caregivers for their younger siblings that have to work to help support their family. Um, that don't have active parents uh, in the home to um, really reinforce those things, that don't live a neighborhood life that allows them to do those things. There are lots of restrictions that make homework both impractical and in some cases irresponsible. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't think about or interact with those things. But those pieces should be um, choice driven rather than mandates. I'll also add that tests and quizzes are often the least effective way to, uh, for students to demonstrate what they know. They become a game. If you get uh, an 85 percent on a quiz, most times students will respond with, yeah, all right, cool, I don't have to redo it, rather than what's that other part that I don't know. However, authentic artifacts that we as teachers are willing to pass back and forth um, until they meet uh, standards and requirements um, is another big piece. The one last piece I'll add and then I'll kind of introduce you to 3D Game Lab a little bit more is this idea of, of, home, of, of due dates. Um, I've been teaching for almost two years now in an environment with no due dates and of course every student, only about half the students would even pass a class like that. Um, no, n not true at all. Uh, when you remove due dates, you remove the arbitrary block of time you have told your students or insinuated to your students that they need to put between the day it was assigned and the day they'll begin working on it. We're all really good at prioritizing, triaging our world. It's so busy, right? We have all these things that are going on. We, we look at what's really important and we put that first. We take those things that are not important and we put them to the back of the stack. Yet we penalize our students when they wait until Tuesday night to start that assignment when we've, in essence, told them it's not important because it's not due until this day. If students have the ability to select activities that they're ready to work on now and begin working on that and turn it in whenever they choose, they do things much, much faster. Um, our research shows that in a class that uh, used to offer about 20 activities over the course of a gradebook driven semester, students are now completing about 37 uh, activities in a single semester uh, with, without those specific calendar restrictions. Also, I'm, I'm a big believer that, it, uh, that all of us have different work cycles. Some can sit down on a Monday afternoon and just bust out uh, a bunch of things that we need to get done within a certain category and then we move to the next most pressing thing. We find that students will sit down and do two or three activities uh, in a single afternoon. 
um, or, or start one and then finish another one over here, um, that they'll work consistently and then they'll uh, inexplicably take a week off and we won't see them for a little while. Well, you ask them, how, well, what's been going on? Well, actually, I was sick and I was traveling and I did this. And, and, but there's no penalty for them breaking up their work like that. We give them the ability to do that. So, uh, and I'm, I may have to jump up and grab a power supply here in a minute because I just got the, you're running out of battery warning. Um, this, the com battery on this computer tends to run down a little bit faster when I'm uh, just talking incessantly and just being a windbag. I think it just tells me, you know, maybe you ought to break it up a little bit. Okay, so I want to I want to take a look here and look for any uh, comments or questions um, that we did have uh, one comment. You, um, yeah. or I was going to say we did have one comment earlier on that I don't think was answered. Well, maybe you did answer it. Um, where Vanessa said that she was worried about replacing intrinsic motivation with extrinsic motivation. Mm. Okay, so so this idea of uh, we've been we've been bantering about with how how we want to motivate our students uh, from the start. And, and deciding on a course of action. Okay, so we want to do more intrinsic, so we want to teach them the love of, of our, our subject areas first, and then, you know, and then other times we'll say, well, okay, but, but placing this uh, system in the classroom, it shows this improvement. These. The bottom line is that all of our students are dramatically different and motivated by different things. Some really appreciate um, a structure by which they can track their progress quickly. Uh, the system we built has progress bars. Um, now, do do I want to do a do I want to screen share here and show some screenshots or what do we think? Uh, do I have that ability in the Google? Oh yeah, Hangout? hold hold on. Let me okay. let me come back and it'll just take like a couple seconds. But let's go back. Okay, to I'll continue. I'll continue talking about um, the in, in, intrinsic um, extrinsic uh, debate. So what happens when we give our students choice? Often they will choose things uh, in a frame that most meets their needs at the moment. So if, if I were to ask you, and go ahead and type this into chat, please, which of the two following activities would you choose? Would you jump off a 10 meter diving platform or would you swim 100 meters in the pool? So tell me which one you'd do. But there's water in the pool, so you sickos don't go, well, are there spikes at the bottom of the pool? There's, this is not a trick. And you now have the screen. You are now broadcasting your screen. Okay, excellent. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to get to the, um, the point here in the production that is meaningful. Actually, I'll probably just zoom out. Grab it. All right, I'm, I'm probably going to jump up here in about uh, 15 seconds and uh, run and grab that. So let me, let me see what people said here. So we've got dive, jump, jump, yep, dive, dive, jump. No, we, we don't have any swimmers. Man, this is, a, this is a brave group. In a bigger group, okay, there we go, swim. <laughs> Humu humu nuku nuku apu a a. Very good. That's a great name. I better get extra credit for being able to pronounce it. Um, so the idea here is that you all choose for different reasons. Throw, uh, just type in why you chose the one you chose. And while you do that, I will give myself new electricity. So um, we're, we're seeing interesting comments in Second Life. We have some people choosing gravity, so others the thrill, <laughs> the rush of it. Um, another is to get it over with. Um, another answer is like heights and flying. And then um, another person is half afraid of the dive and half want the exercise of the swim. And then we, we also had the excitement as, as, answer, as answers to that question. So 
yeah. We, okay. We had so numerous answers. <laughs> I love the numerous answers, and and here's what I'll say to this: if you look and and pay close attention to the way that different people answer, you'll see some similarities. All of these decisions are based on this idea of schema, right? right? That you have developed a schema that either makes the selection of an activity that is faster, that has a thrill, okay? Um, and I, I, I love Humus. Uh, piece also, you know, half and half, right? Um, the exercise of the swim, that's driven, um, that's driven by uh, schema as well. So the interesting thing is that we all make decisions based on experiences that we've had in the past, and that's a valuable thing. Now, if I tell you that the reason I asked you to choose one of these things is that we're in day one of our Aquatics 101 class, and in that Aquatics 101 class, I need to do a basic water acclimation assessment. I need to find out, can you get in? Can you swim, uh, change direction in the water, and can you swim over to the nearest side? Very quickly, with these two activities, we will have those that self-declare and say, I can't, I am not comfortable with either of those. And that's always one of the options. But I wanted to see which ones you choose. Um, many will choose the activity that is the most interesting to them at the time, but both serve the same assessment need, if that makes any sense. So this idea of a multiplicitous curriculum, that if we're really focused on the standards, doesn't have to be tied to one activity that we've loved from the start or have used from the start. We look at different ways to, uh, to diversify that curriculum and to give students more choice, because in that choice, we expose a schema that is unique to them and ultimately motivating in their selection of learning activities. So 20 activities in, uh, in the EdTech 202 class, which is Introductory Technology Skill for Teachers. And uh, originally 20 activities. Now it's 83 or 84 activities that are part of this pool that students can choose from. That curriculum looks different and, and is available in different ways, but the idea that there are always meaningful choices um, is something that, who, who was it that said it? Um, somebody type it in for me because you know, creator of Spore. Why can't I remember his name right now? Will Wright. Thank you very much. I knew if anybody... <laughs> this group would know. Will Wright uh, is always looking for um, the opportunity to make interesting choices, that players should always have the ability to make interesting choices. Now, giving a student the ability to choose their activity, you'll, they'll select one, and they'll answer one of a handful of ways. One, I chose that one because it was easier. We're going to come back to that one in a second. I chose that one because it was something new. I chose that one because it was something I wanted to learn. It was something I chose that one because my friend chose that one, and we thought we could do it together. Those are all valid reasons built around individual schema. My favorite one, though, is easy, because easy doesn't mean that it lacks complexity. It doesn't mean that um, it is not um, a robust activity that requires a lot of thinking or design or creation skills. Um, it simply means that they had the schema to be able to attend to that when it was offered. We find that a student will say, well, that one looks too hard. They'll actually circle back and come back to that activity later once they develop more schema in that area to come back to select an activity. So, yes, easy for one, difficult for another, but tying these types of activities clearly to standards um, allows us the freedom to not make one activity be the end-all be-all that we can offer and, and expand curriculum, constantly change it so that it meets the needs of our students right now. So I want to show you a couple things. Can you see my screen? Yep, we can see, your, we can see you. Okay, if good. Um, so I'll show you this real quick. Um, and if, I don't know if I go to full screen. Do you still see it in full screen? 
Um, go ahead and yeah, hit full screen and we'll see if it shows. We'll let you know. Oh, I'm in it right now, so probably not. Okay. Okay. Did you click on on the top where it says screen share on the nav bar? In the hangout. Let me see. Ah, uh, there we go. Screen share. Now we'll just go just go to the whole desktop here. All right, so you'll be able to see it. And you get to see now into infinity. Yeah, we see that a lot on Google Hangouts. <laughs> okay, so here we are in a Presti. Nice. So, so the, I mean, this idea, you know what, I'll log you straight into stinking 3D Game Lab. Let's do it this way. Cool. So this is the tool we created. And so to kind of uh, break down this paradigm, one more time, Brush that. We're looking for ways to give students the opportunity to make interesting choices, to do what we as designers of education and, uh, and teachers should do, which is uh, to creatively track that learning and, uh, and give students the ability to work through a curriculum without punishing them arbitrarily for things that may or may not be within their sphere of complete control i.e. Uh, homework, uh, because that does punish some students, and, um, and due dates. Often homework will do a better job of telling us which homes have parents that are actively involved in the uh, process of helping students learn study skills um, than the overall intelligence and aptitude of the student. And I would argue that, that all students are intelligent, that they just um, have or lack different schema. So. This is the system. Let me, actually, let me log in as, as yeah, no, uh, I'll do it this way. This idea um, is, is a relatively simple one. This is what a, a student or a teacher would see. You have quests that are available. Um, you have a tab for those that are in progress and those that are completed. I'll actually log in as, a, um, as another user. So you can uh, see a little bit more of this. I'll log in as our favorite guy, Buster Bronco. That's your demo student. He, yeah, he, he's the one that I actually, and I'll actually play as him in other people's groups because my account is built as kind of a super user, super admin. So here I am in EdTech 202, which is the, one of the classes I teach. Um, so I'll be able to show you some quests. This shows how many are available, how many are currently in progress, and how many are complete. I can click on any of these tabs and see these. The idea that, uh, that you select the activities that you want, you work on them as you want, and then you see the, uh, the progression of you through the curriculum, um, unique to you is a, is a very, very game-like feature. But I think it's worth pointing out that we're not really talking about game elements specifically, although games have these elements in them, we're talking about alternative and in many cases more effective methods of feedback. So if someone says, well, we're not interested in gaming, you know, ga you know oh, gamification tends to have, you know, both negative and, and positive connotations. But for those who find it negative, we say we're, we're offering students different feedback. So quests themselves are uh, are individual learning activities built around a concept category curriculum. Um, and each of those completed quests are worth a certain amount of experience points. So you would select this activity called Blogger. It's worth 50 experience points. I can tell right now that the average time to complete is 34 minutes and that it's got a little over four stars as a rating. If I want, as a learner, I can also view the public comments left by other users. Not familiar with blogging, so it was a little tricky. Great intro to blogs. Never made a blog before. Hmm. Might be fun or distracting. Ah, heck. What's one more distraction? So students are, are giving their feedback 
throughout the process here. This is very unique in education because we don't often ask our students in the process what they what they think you know of of the learning activities although I can't think of a better group to crowdsource um, effective instruction than a group of students who are married to it who live it uh, every day of their life they're full-time professional students they should be pretty good at evaluating learning activities so that's one of the things that we wanted to do so for example a low rated uh, quest to a teacher should immediately set off alarms. In fact, the system also sets off alarms and, uh, and gives you the opportunity to find out what's wrong with that, to improve it, that there are things that are broken. So I'm going to start this quest, much like a student would. Now, on the other page, it's moved from my, uh, my available to my in progress. Now, this learning activity right here has the description. Here's what you need to do. Here are the deliverables. Here are some resources. Here's an embedded video that you can watch, how to create a blog with Blogger. That you can watch right in the window. And here's how you submit your completed project. Then uh, I would simply, as a user, go up when I'm ready. I've completed it. I, I click uh, Complete. Wait for the WYSIWYG to load. And then I type in whatever or attach whatever document is necessary to, to prove this. Now, it might be an in-class activity where I've just completed an experiment with beakers and things like that, and I can say, I've done it, and you checked it off, and my password was, you know, goofy foot. I don't know. Um, once, um, I'm just going to type done here so you can see the next screen. It makes a cute little noise, which you may or may not be able to hear through uh, the Hangout. And then I, as a user, have the ability to go, well, okay, that took me 15 minutes. And I'm going to give it a rating of, I liked it a lot, five stars, and here's my comment to other users. So, awesome, right? It's not very descriptive, and students who are familiar with uh, digital communities will often give much, much better feedback than, than I will in this. And this quest, as I submit it now, goes to the teacher for approval. It's completed, and I can look at it here and I see that it's pending approval. So I can then click on it and see other stuff about it. Um, well, I don't, I don't have any comments left there. Let me see. Yeah. So, um, but if for some reason um, the teacher found that this was lacking, it didn't quite meet the expectation. It was, uh, you know, subpar in some way it would show back up in, in progress as needs attention, also in yellow instead of red, but needs attention. When this is approved by the teacher, those points show up. Quest can either be uh, auto approval, which is you know reserved for things like read this and do a short response, watch this video, it's kind of an introductory video to what we're going to be doing. Um, those, the system might automatically approve based on the way the teacher set it up, or uh, it might be something that is um, uh, something that a teacher will want to look at every single example. Also, individual students can be earmarked so that we investigate all of their work and approve it. What's unique about this paradigm is if the student makes a mistake, if they lack the schema, uh, and sometimes that schema is the motivation to do it uh, exactly the way it's been indicated, they are not punished for an incorrect effort. In fact, like a video game, we have the opportunity to use that as a reteaching moment. Say, oh, this is great. But in, you know, in professional uh, you know, discourse, we capitalize I's, single I's. You know, we use punctuation. Um, BRB is replaced by be right back, or I'll be back in a moment. You know, we, we can actually teach them around that mistake rather than saying, well, it was pretty close, so we're going to give you an 85%, which establishes to many students, oh, well, this is all I have to do. <laughs> and, and again, they're not penalized when, uh, when they submit that, and it's correct regardless of how many times the teacher can approve that, and they get full credit. And it represents the same as the person who did it the first time. Because again, we're not trying to sort students. We're trying to allow them to reach a specific level. I'm sure that there are some questions. Let me, uh, let me show you just a couple more things on the student side here. I can look anytime at my player card. 
the, the top progress bar shows my distance, and it's, uh, it's pretty interesting here, uh, all the way to the completion of this course. The bottom one shows me the distance to my next rank. So ranks, like, like in a game, might unlock different abilities. They might unlock different curriculum or, uh, or quests. Uh, they might do a number of different things. This player card shows me how many I've completed. I don't have any badges or achievements here in this group, but I have completed um, quite a few quests um, in different um, ISTE standards and showing my accumulation of artifacts as they meet the standards that have been set up for this course. Also showing the progress bars of, uh, of those standards within the curriculum and those categories within the curriculum. Shows me the quests that I've completed if I had any that were in progress. Also shows me all of my recent activity. This is available to both student and teacher and students' friends if the student gives them that ability. So we can check out each other's player cards and see what you've been working on and, and how you're doing in the class. Rewards are available as well in three different basic tiers, badges, achievements, and awards. Now these are all grayed out right now because I haven't earned any of them, but I can click on the word wizard and find out what might represent in your curriculum some major piece of, of, you know, maybe required activity. Maybe it's necessary for the completion of your course that you produce a, a senior portfolio or something like that. Um, you can then build badges that do exactly that. Also, we're in the process of coding right now the Mozilla OBI, um, the Open Badges Infrastructure, so that these can that the system can award badges directly to the Mozilla Digital Backpack, and we're going to be the first learning management system that's able to do that, to actually award um, meta badges that are valued within extended communities, which we can talk about that all day another time. But, um, and, and of course, a student can view their group. Basically, any student who has said, yes, I'm fine with you looking at my progress. Um, these are covered by COPPA and uh, FERPA, so uh, students are identified primarily by their uh, by a, a nondescript um, uh, nondescript uh, name. Um, if we are we disagree with the name that they've chosen, we can uh, we can remove it. So or have them have them change it, uh, block it in some way. Let me show you real quick the teacher side because that may be meaningful to you. And I think there have been some questions, loads of feedback. And uh, as, I, as I'm logging in here, I'll just give you some kind of snap demographics uh, from the, the study that we were able to produce. 93% of all students received A's or A pluses um, in the curriculum. I've actually got an infographic that will show us this. Some of you, I think, have seen it, but I'll share it with you anyway. Again, 93% of all students received an A or an A+. There were no Bs, there were no Cs, there were no Ds. There were a handful of Fs and a couple of incompletes, and I'll share the difference between those in a moment. What you see here, and can you see this, by the way, Kay? Oh, yeah, we're all, we're all seeing it. In fact, it's beautiful. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you very much. It's my favorite infographic. It's the first one I ever created. But um, each of these red lines represents the experience of a single student in the course of the curriculum. This is their uh, achievement, if you will, um, the, uh, shown in experience points, the amount of experience points earned toward that winning condition. You'll notice that 2,000 points is that white line. That was the requirement to get the A. So if you got to 2,000 points and submitted a completed portfolio, which is the assessment in lieu of a multiple choice test, a portfolio that is broken out by the standards, which shows how they met standard one, it was these artifacts, and standard two, these artifacts. It included a few other things like how they thought technology fit in the role of education, um, and what their future plans were. And it was also a storage device for most of their 
their digital artifacts. Things like back to school newsletters, uh, parent night Prezi presentations, uh, annotated video playlists using YouTube videos and their own uh, you know, description of what their, their students were going to watch, embedded in their blog, those kind of things, right? Um, you notice something very strange. If you could stop at 2,000 points just by submitting your portfolio and walk away from the class, whether it was week five or week 12 or week 16, why in the world does the vast majority of the participants far exceed the requirement? I'm asking you this. Why in the world would that happen? They're done at 2,000. They don't have to show up anymore. Why do you think? Learning community? I would agree. I think some just enjoyed being engaged in the process with other folks. Why do you think? Any other thoughts? Yes. Many of them reported. And so I would ask them, you know, I'm like, you're doing great. And you're done. Why are you here? And they would say, oh, I don't know. I just, you know, I really wanted to do that. Or I passed over this one before and it looked like something I should really know how to do. So I went back and did it myself. There were no requirements that they continue doing it. They want, some wanted to challenge themselves. There were a couple of them that did compete for that top spot. Not all, but a couple of them. They were motivated by the competition. So we let folks choose what are you going to be motivated by. The motivated by getting the grade that you want, motivated by the reward systems, the badges, um, motivated by leveling up. Um, a lot of students report and continue to report that they're really interested to see what happens when they get to that next uh, rank level. What happens when I move from uh, learner three uh, to designer one? What happens then? Um, very, very interesting to them. I'll, I'll show you just briefly what that looks like. Anytime a student wants to see where, where they are, they can click on uh, their rank and see what the ranks are in a, uh, in, a, in a group. I'll show you one more thing in here. Uh, one and a half more things that I think you might find interesting. This is the teacher approval panel. It shows me how many quests that I have ready to approve. It shows you how many I've approved. And I can search those at any time. I've got a search box over here. If I just want to see what one student's experience would be, you know, maybe I noticed something that wasn't quite right and I want to go back and check something else. Um, and it shows how many that I've returned to other users that are actively returned right now. That they're in their court, if you will, and waiting for some action. It also shows you how long ago these were submitted. Right? all the way down to 11 minutes. Oh, and that was Buster's that we just did. So I'll go to Buster's here, right? Buster, you know, he submitted it. It wasn't quite what I want. I didn't want him to say done. Doggone it, Buster. I want, you know, please submit a URL. Uh, dummy. <laughs> um, and I've got a WYSIWYG here. I can drop in video. I can drop in images. I can give the student whatever resources I want. I have a list of, of common uh, uh, issues that I can address in here. By the way, uh, I've noticed that if, if I'm having an issue often enough that I need to have a scripted response for how they should fix it, it's probably a pretty good indication that I need to rewrite the quest so that they don't have to do that. But, um, but that's, you know, for me. And then I'll submit. And this then goes back into Buster's uh, in progress with a little note that says this needs attention. He'll be mad at me for calling him a dummy. But uh, I can select any of these activities that I want to uh, approve right now. I might be trying to help one student get through. Um, but this is also very telling um, how many hours ago it's been done. I can also, at any time, click on a student's player card and just see what their progress is. She submitted this quest, and I just want to see where she's at. She's earned a badge. She's earned a couple of achievements. 
The difference between badges, achievements, and awards, the way we've described them, badges represent collections of activities or representative knowledge or specialization within a specific area. You earn a badge to show that you can do this. Achievements are typically more system related that motivate some students, not all, to, uh, to make progress through a course of study. So complete five quests in five days and earn that achievement. It comes with a, a you know, 25 point experience point bonus. Um, so there, it advances them through the curriculum for doing this as a reward for doing it. Some are really drawn to these achievements. They want to get all the achievements. They want to light up the whole board, as it were. Awards are those types of things that we choose to give to a student instead of uh, having them automatically award it. The top two automatically award. You can build a reward and say, okay, these are the requisite conditions for this award to be granted, and you can let the system do it. Um, awards are those types of things that we give a student as forms of encouragement or to represent expanded uh, artifacts or something that's just spectacular. The gold star, if you will. No one else has to see it unless other people look. And, uh, and it give, usually it gives them a, a point bonus. Some of you are looking, you gave a student a kitten? Absolutely. <laughs> I love to give them a kitten. It means they've done something special. You know, they, they added some imagery to, a, to an ordinary blog post, and it really it made it so much better. It was, you know, I want to reward students for, for when they do things that are creative. Also, these types of awards can serve, here's where it, this bends your mind a little bit, can serve as prerequisites to entire groups uh, of curriculum. Imagine having something set aside for only the students who are ready for it, interested in it, or needed it. Maybe that is introductory material when they don't have the schema to attend to that thing in your box yet. They're, they missed an experience because they transferred in from another school or they had a sick semester and never got through that piece. You can give them curriculum that's not available to everybody else to bring them up to the level so that they can start with the rest of your curriculum. In my class, it's very practical. We have non-Facebookers um, non that come back to be teachers. Um, uh, you know, stereotypically, uh, a dad or a mom who's been working in another profession for years, um, hates it, now really wants to get uh, back and be a teacher again, but they haven't been on the computer. They don't know what a right click is. They don't know how to operate a trackpad on a laptop. They don't know how to uh, co copy and paste with shortcuts. They don't even know that you can undo something you've done. There has to be an opportunity where our curriculum can give them this schema without singling them out, making them feel embarrassed, because any learning is good learning. It doesn't matter if it's, it's the same point as someone else. So I can give them this. This uh, happens to be, it says video key. It actually unlocks curriculum specific to creating your own YouTube videos using a variety of tools. So a student has said, I'm really interested in that area. I can give them, to, uh, give them that curriculum without uh, making it available to everybody and confusing, because we talked about you know, a handful of, of, of interesting choices. Well, choosing between 30 activities is not interesting. It's overwhelming. Choosing between six or eight is interesting if that makes any sense. So I can specialize in, and deliver curriculum, and I can see what they've done. So these are the ones uh, that this student has in progress. This is an actual student player card, super mom. These are all the things she's done when she did them. She's been pretty active over the last 24 hours. And here is a list of her completed activities, what day they were due, and how much they were worth, which is always interesting. Uh, I like to look at these sometimes to notice big gaps. And uh, again, I mean, I'm not going to regulate that, oh, a student must complete one quest every day. But um, if it's been a while since a student's turned something in, um, it gives me the opportunity to uh, ask how I can help. And sometimes it's, you know, life taking over. And sometimes it's, I just don't understand how to use my laptop. Oh, well, hold on. I'm going to give you this group of quests. Start there. And, and it can build them back up to where we are. Um, we there, had there, Oh, I was yeah. going to say, we had a couple questions. Let's address the questions. Do you, since you've seen them go by, do you mind just kind of 
delivering, uh, issuing them? Oh, sure, you, sure. Let, let me start them. Uh, there's no problem with that. Um, Grid Jumper asked if has this been tested with all age levels, or um, just that it works more effectively with certain age levels. There are about 280 beta teachers worldwide. Many of them in the United States. We have you know, some in Israel and Japan and Korea, and um, and they're working all with their own groups. Um, the earliest one that we know of is second grade, and it's technology-specific education, but it's being used in all subject areas that we're aware of, K-12 and uh, higher ed. Wow, that was a surprisingly concise answer. I think I need to <laughs> fill in with more. Okay, and then the other one we have from the YouTube channel um, is it looks like a heavy workload for the teacher. Is it, and can the load be shared in some way? Well, yes. Boy, that was a perfectly staged infomercial-like question. Well, how can I do this? Well, I'm glad you asked because um, one of the things that, that Lisa and I talked about in the very beginning that was important to us is that, that each teacher not have to reinvent the wheel. So every quest that is created in the system automatically comes with Creative Commons licensing. So it is available to be searched and then cloned by any other user as its default. Now, having said that, you can set a quest to private. It's not visible to anybody else, but I can go into the quest armory and I can do a quick search for anything that uses, let's just say, Google Docs. It searches the tags of all of these quests, every quest in the system, and I can see all of these different quests. Now, I can click on them to expand them to learn a little bit more. Courier run with special files. I'm not sure what that is. That's really interesting. Right? Um, I haven't seen the vast majority of these quests. There are about 3,000 users in the system right now, and somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 quests, I believe is correct now. It expands every day. And I can search. Now, these intelligent search features um, are only getting better. And we believe that eventually, within the next year or so, um, the learner analytics piece will be built in such a way that teachers will receive notifications and suggestions based on the way that their students are performing on certain types of quests and the tags of those quests and suggest additional curriculum that might supplement what they're working on. It either meets the standards or probably meets the standards, uh, meets the, uh, the interest in, and, uh, and uh, success patterns of their students or even specific students. Um, you know, that, that Jazz Honky 61, which would be a gamer tag, I would imagine, <laughs> um, would really may benefit from this quest and, you know, or these quests. So, uh, you have access to about 25,000 quests. Now, each one of these you can clone and then change. Creative Commons licensing, the way we've got it, just requires attribution. So the original quest was developed by this person, and you have added your own deliverable or added a video of you explaining it. And here's, I mean, you can you can customize the uh, cloned curriculum uh, any way you want. The next piece, and we're in the process of working through this right now, is the ability to bring in entire curriculum built by sponsored groups. Uh, we're building a NOAA curriculum right now built on the five uh, NOAA science areas, weather, oceans and coasts, freshwater, all, you know, all those, um, atmosphere, and I always forget the fifth one, uh, probably soft serve ice cream because there's something <laughs> scientifically weird about that. It's you notice it's not dairy. They can't call it um, ice cream. <laughs> it's uh, it's like frozen dairy product or something. I, yeah, they, <laughs> it has to be classified a certain way, which should creep you out. If it doesn't, um, then I. But you cover it. You notice, yeah, you cover it with chocolate. You turn it into a dip cone, and you don't care what's in it. You know, I mean, there could be pieces of kitten in it, and you're like, I, it doesn't matter. It's dipped. It's got chocolate dip. So, are there any are there any other questions related to that before I <laughs> head on out to Dairy Queen? If you're looking to go back and start tagging the quests with learning objectives, 
That's a really interesting thing, Abacus, and I would expect a really interesting question from you of all people. Yes, the, the, uh, the way that those pieces can be tagged is evolving. Right now, we have a tags field, which is, is part of that search. It searches the content, it searches the title, and the short description. So it's looking for any of those pieces. Any unique identifiers that are in that description anywhere will be picked out. So learning objectives re require a little bit more googly kind of search that looks for context. I think that those types of pieces will be built in. More likely, someone will develop a Ruby gem that allows us to just install that into our search functionality, and it'll add that piece, and it'll be tuned and controlled by somebody. It, you know how those types of pieces work. The so more likely, um, we'll, uh, we'll borrow uh, or plug in that type of technology uh, to identify specific learning objectives rather than um, me sit down with a pen and paper and try to sketch it out myself. Common Core Ruby Gem. In fact, the Common Core standards are already in the system, and you can tag any uh, quest to any uh, currently approved Common Core standard. We're also bringing in the new science curriculum standards, which are the going to be the predecessor to the Common Core. You know how these agencies do their their thing. Um, so we're going to bring those in, and we'll we'll modify them. There are also a number of tools. One of them we're thinking about bringing in, which will allow us access to every state standard. So you can immediately tag. So you could search by state standards, uh, Iowa, science, you know, these types of things, and pull up any and all quests that are tied to that. Now, you may or may not find the curriculum there. I will tell you from building curriculum, I started um, basically 18 months ago. No, no, it'll be about, it'll be two years um, this, um, this August uh, by creating a, um, a 40 quest curriculum. And it has expanded to 80. Some I borrowed from other people. Many I've taken from dialogue with the students where we co-create. It goes back to that uh, question, and then I'll kind of open this up because I realize we're running long here. Um, that, that good curriculum uh, is co-created with our students because it meets their needs and interests while still meeting the mandates that, that we're charged with. I'm a big believer and this is one of those quotes that uh, would look nice as a lower back tattoo. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> that perhaps our job as teachers is to loosen the restrictions on how our students learn. Loosen those restrictions and apply the context to what they learn. They don't need us to learn. They could learn most everything in our class by being savvy enough on the Internet. Um, they need us to get credit. And so we have this, this relationship where they, they value us as individuals, but they don't value the institutions that we represent because they're not up to date. They're not meaningful. So if we can co-create that experience, create something that we believe is, is foundationally strong and should be motivating to many students, but are willing to ask that question. So, so if you don't want to jump and you don't want to swim, Here's what we have to demonstrate. Is there another way we can do that? To which many students will say, well, yeah, if you just want to see me change direction and you know, go to and from, um, then I'll do that right here. I, you know, I can say, do you want to do that in the five foot or the eight foot? Um, I'll do that in the eight foot. Let, you know, again, giving them meaningful choices and interesting choices. Um, then we've created a new activity, and that can be made available to any student who needs it. This idea of co-creating curriculum has been the most enjoyable part of my job over the last two years. Um, one quick anecdote. I had two uh, young men who said, yeah, you know, this game-based approach is, is cool and all, but we're not really using games to learn. You can't do that. I'm like, why? So, well, they're not designed for you to learn, so you don't learn when you play them. I said, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> so I said, what games are you guys into right now? And they listed off a few, and I said, tell you what, I'm going to bring in an Xbox tomorrow. And I'm going to bring in Call of Duty World at War, which is a uh, World War II-based first-person shooter. It's got a nice cooperative mode they can play together. Hooked it up to one of the TVs in the classroom. I said, go over there for half an hour, and I want to hear from you. I have a quest for you, and it's to play video games for 30 minutes. And they're like, what? I said, yes, go do it. So they did. 
Um, and then I said, we'll chat about it afterwards. And I, they came back and they said, oh, that was really fun. I said, okay, so what levels did you play through? We talked about that. And I asked them some very specific questions about that introductory level. I said, okay, so what is it? And it happens to be the Mankin campaign. It's, a, it's an island. They, um, they meet he American forces and very specific characters that, that the game develops is fighting against Japanese um, soldiers. And there are some cut scenes that are, uh, you know, intriguing and, and there's a very big difference between the American troops protocol and the Japanese troops protocol. And they noticed that and talked about that. And I said, well, why is that? And so we talked about it a little bit more. In the end of this conversation, they had, in essence, come up with something that was meaningful to learn from that game. And I said, okay, now here, I've got another quest for you. You're going to play this tomorrow, and I'm going to play it. But go out and just see if there's anything, a YouTube video, a letter, a description, that might highlight the cultural differences between these two forces built around this time. They came back with video. I mean, they basically just did a ton of research. They, they dropped it into a Google uh, site page and embedded these videos and had it all ready for me. So, all right, I'm great. I'm going to play this. And I invited someone else to play it with me. And I said, now, now come up with some assessment that isn't a multiple choice test that will allow me to share what I've learned through this experience by, by paying attention to the context that you have given me, the cultural differences between um, you know, uh, the Americans um, using flank maneuvers and the Japanese doing a bonsai charge. That, was, that really struck them. I said, can you imagine what, it would be going, what would be going through your mind as you jumped up from a concealed position with bayonet fixed and charged into gunfire. And they were just blown away by this idea. It was really impactful, this, this discussion we were having. And in the end, in the end, it is, it is, it is a grand trick. They played video games for a week in my class, right? They just played. I mean, they tell all their friends, I haven't been doing any work, I've been playing, you know, and, and finding links. How easy is that? In the end, I got out of them um, a curriculum of how to play the, this introductory level what things to look for, videos that talk about the difference in the culture, and, um, and an assessment that they designed themselves, which is to write a letter home and talk about what happened in your first day of battle, you know, back to your mom and your brothers and sisters and those kind of things, and, and created something really meaningful out of a video game because we weren't so glued to the curriculum that we had developed as the only way to learn this, and willing to accept all different forms of experience as long as we made the connections back to uh, the standards. So they met all the ISTE standards, you know, for that semester. But really, in those, they met one, two, and three, uh, and and had really strong artifacts to show for it: lesson plans, um, you know, uh, assessments. It was it was really pretty cool. So that's what I have for you. I mean, I'll entertain any questions. Um, and I think you will have some questions. Okay. Okay. Any qu any questions for Chris? Questions, comments, that kind of stuff. I wonder if you have stunned them into silence. I think most of them are probably just playing video games right now and calling it research. That's what I would be doing. <laughs> okay, um, Grid Jumper asks us, when will Game Lab be available? So it's available right now. Um, currently, we're in a closed beta. It's just moved outside of the universities in that process right now, being licensed to an external corporation. Actually, um, Lisa Dolly, who left the university, created something called GoGo -Go Labs, which is um, in essence, a technology, educational technology incubator. And uh, she's running a number of projects out of that. She's licensed our invention. I'm staying at the university, um, but she's licensed uh, our invention and is going to begin to make that available and to market it. I know Grid, grid usually steals good questions. And, uh, and it's, it's available. Right now, the way to access it is to, is to participate in one of our teacher camps. There is one that is starting on the, um, uh, on the 1st of August and will run three weeks. Um, don't worry. You don't have to pack bug spray and your shorty shorts. It's not that kind of camp. 
Although usually during the camp I wear my shorty shorts the whole time, but that's just me. And we uh, we're we're taking uh, we're bringing folks into the system. Uh, everybody who joins the camp, I believe, um, there are continuing education credits for it. There are five different correction, six different strands built into this camp, including how to use the system. But we've also got. Um, well, Kate, you're doing one. Yep. We're Tell me about machina. yours. We're doing Machinima. Oh, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Um, there, there's a, um, there's another one uh, being one, uh, being, being, uh, another strand uh, on app creation uh, by uh, Yu Chong, um, uh, Yu Chong Shu uh, from uh, Boise State. Uh, actually, I mean, it's really, really cool. He and I went through it the other day, and I got to look at a lot of the curriculum that he's developed. And uh, basically, you learn how to create uh, iPod and uh, Android apps um, and get a badge for, for completing it. Uh, there's a gamer strand that I've developed, um, which is really exciting. There's a technology integration strand, which is really cool. Most of the time, you get to play games. Call it professional development. There you go. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, I believe the camp, I think, I think it's a 295 fee, which covers the camp, but more importantly covers, um, covers the bandwidth for, uh, for you and 60 of your students uh, for no less than a year. Um, we don't have an end point at this point. We've actually had folks in the system for over a year, and, uh, and we're not renewing at this point. We're just extending um, as we build our, our beta community. Uh, uh, there may be other ways to to get him right now. It tends to be tends to be camps. There seems to be um, these really cool teacher camps that come around um, pretty regularly. Um, they really every three four months anymore. So new and exciting curriculum each time. You can jump in and uh, and be a part of it each time, whether you've attended a camp or not. It's pretty cool. So more questions. Yes, it's being used in corporate training quite a bit because you can create a standalone um, curriculum that qualifies someone in a specific area. Uh, I know that some folks are using it for sexual harassment training, so they can just plug folks in and they start to get these credentials and qualify through uh, uh, through different curriculum that might be uh, uh, might be available in, in that professional development um, or excuse me corporate uh, training type of thing. Um, and because they can work through it at their own pace, they can, you know, work through it in their wherever they are. And I, I'm, I maybe you want to comment on this a little, but as far as as I'm aware of, um, you guys are going to continue to improve this. It's it's not you know it's it's not static. You guys no. are are continually building on this, right? Yes. In the beginning, um, it was nothing but duct tape and post-its, um, which were effective. Uh, and, but just not online. Um, people's screens would get covered with posts. They wouldn't be able to see stuff. It didn't work. Um, <laughs> no, but we've, there, there was an alpha version, which, um, which I may actually share with some folks um, during camp this year just for fun so that they can see where we came from. It, it was very effective, uh, but it's pretty blocky and goofy looking. Um, so a lot of the new features that are going in, first of all, um, one of the big things I'm interested in is um, more prerequisite uh, combinations. So rather than uh, a quest being unlocked uh, by completing this quest or these five quests, same with badges, um, it could be three of these five or 500 points in category X. All of these different uh, unique ways of, um, of offering prerequisites. Um, I'm really interested in installing the teacher game. Think about this for a second. Is there a value in a teacher approving a quest within the first 12 hours compared to 24 or 48 or 72? I think there is. I think that there is a, uh, uh, a marked benefit for student progress when we give them prompt feedback. So maybe a teacher should be w rewarded with 50 experience points of their own for approving a quest within the first, you know, Four hours, eight hours, whatever that may be. How about creating a, a quest that gets cloned by a lot of people? Shouldn't there be experience points for that? Shouldn't we be playing the teacher game ourselves 
by, uh, by earning experience points for doing really good things? What if we give a comment to a student and it's really valuable? Can they give a thumbs up and we get a little thing? I, I do have to tell you, um, even we're doing it on a very, very small scale with awards in our games MOOC, mm -hmm. but the people who won last week, we've gotten comments um, in, in our post by each and every one of them about having having won something and about how they were excited because we, we, we had like for best blog post, best um, forum comment, um, best screenshot and, and we got comments from each of them and, and these are experienced educators but they were still, they, they still seem to have enjoyed got, having gotten it. We're, uh, that's very cool. We're planning on also building in, and as you mentioned that, it reminded me, we're also planning on building in a virtual economy. So a teacher can uh, create a virtual store, and those can be virtual goods. You can buy yourself or your avatar a new hat or you know something like that. Uh, or you can buy yourself the template for an activity that you don't have to build from scratch anymore. Um, that, that you could conceivably even extend that to real world goods in a number of different ways. So uh, schools, um, you know, I mean, conceivably Best Buy uh, could, uh, could offer points um, in a school curriculum uh, or, you know, or $5, $10 um, gift cards uh, for the completion of certain badges and things like that. That virtual economy is coming and it'll be teacher driven, you know, and maybe that's a, an extra hall pass. Maybe that's, uh, you know, 20 minutes on the Xbox or something like that. You can, you can level up earn uh, virtual currency in the you know, coins or whatever we decide to call it uh, and, and do that. That's a very interesting thing. Interesting co-development with other universities, absolutely. Are those universities cool? Are there cool people at those universities <laughs> or are they lame? Well, I, perhaps it's the one Delightful's at, so I would say that's cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, a, a, that's exactly right. Teacher, there is nothing about this system that could not be replicated it, on paper in a, in a traditional classroom. But the management of it becomes restrictive, which is why we built it the way we did, so that it's an online tool, so that it's not dependent on being in class uh, to do it, and so that students can see immediately much of the feedback. If you if you fall back to some of the inspirational thinking of someone like Tom Chatfield who talks about different ways to reward the brain, you see a lot of those elements in this design. Um, you know, there's certainly a sense of presence, but uh, the ability to choose from long and short-term aims, badges being long-term, you know, and completion of classes being short, or long-term, individual quests being short-term, or rank advancements as being short-term, those, those things that are achievable, surprising people with awards, and and new quests and abilities. Um, I've got some uh, quests that are actually reward quests that appear when they've completed an achievement. And those quests, I'm not kidding, are simply a video game embedded into a, a quest. And when they get that, they're surprised. They think, what? I get to play an embedded Pac-Man in this quest and I get five XP for it? That's really cool. It was a surprise. They didn't see it coming. And uh, they report that these are really motivating things. Yep. Love Tom's stuff. Um, his book is really interesting, too, uh, which is called uh, uh, Fun Incorporated, or Fun Inc. Do badges travel amongst the courses offered in the LMS, or do they, they currently stay with a particular course? They will populate to another level um, once we have the, uh, the badges backpack um, built in. That was alliterated and unintentional. Sorry about that. <laughs> and okay, so we're going to be wrapping up now. Yep. So anybody have any last questions or comments? And and I do have to I do have to say that that we would um, because we're going to have a couple different um, iterations of, of the games MOOC. So we would love to invite you back because you said you could talk a whole day on the badges thing. So we'd oh love to goodness. invite you. <laughs> we're going to be doing basically a, a short you know sprint of these like each semester. So we'd love to invite you back some other time to talk about that, but not this summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anytime. <laughs>
<laughs> Anytime. Um, Homo, I will mention this to you, that partial, partially gamifying. Um, the class that I described that had um, the outcomes, the ones, basically the, the one that we researched and are able to report on more than anecdotally, those numbers that are, that are uh, delivered. It, th those of you who are university level, you know all about IRBs um, and getting approval to actually do the research. Um, that was a face-to-face -face class not an online class. So it was a mixture of questing and group activities. I al always allowed those students to self-select themselves out of activities that were being done by the full group, arrayed, if you will, to borrow gaming uh, language. And uh, if they were really inspired to work on something else, they were still in the classroom while they were doing it. But um, And that class met twice a week. And the other um, uh, day was either small groups that were interested or completing the same quest that I would kind of move together so that they could uh, benefit from each other or independent questing with a little uh, radio on or something like that just to kind of create an open environment for them to work in. So yeah, this idea of, of partially gamifying is an interesting one because imagine uh, a course that requires the completion of these three badges or three of these five badges but the rest of the course can be completed by collections of quests that equal a certain amount. Does that make any sense? So it is possible to make something game-based to use a tool like this, but also have required elements, and some people do that. There are a million ways that we can do it. That's what's fun about it, is we get to just experiment and look for different ways. Um, the vast vast majority, I think I can only think of one or two, um, that, uh, that did not say that they enjoyed uh, having the choice to do what they wanted to do. So, uh, delightful just made the comment we should make an IRB game. I love the IRB game. <laughs> it, okay, so we're going to be wrapping it up and I, I, I just want to... Um, I just want to remind people of something you said at the beginning. You talked about um, that going two possible ways to go: using games for learning or making learning a game. And and the, those are some things that that I think we really have to talk about. Um, and we're about to be cut off by um, Google Hangouts, so <laughs> 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 so we're gonna, we're going to have to say bye. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me in. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you very much. And we're ending now. Bye. Right. Bye.